afternoon, everyone. Now that we're not saying good morning. Um, I'm Pam Sebesky. I'm the vice chair for Virginia for the transportation planning board and I call the November 17th, 2021 TPB's meeting to order. As we continue to meet virtually during the pandemic, we will continue to live stream the audio and video of this meeting on the internet and on YouTube. We will begin in person meetings as soon as conditions permit us to do so while being able to follow all public safety precautions. While we are all familiar with our process for these virtual meetings for the benefit of those following the meeting online, I will briefly review the procedures we will be following during this virtual meeting. To start the meeting, I will ask staff to take a roll call of members or alternates to document your presence at this meeting and to determine that we have a quorum. Then for the action items on the agenda, um, I will have the presenter complete their briefing, then invite a motion to approve and seek a second for the motion made. After the motion has been made and seconded, I will invite questions or comments in turn by jurisdiction before calling for a vote. For the vote, I will seek just the nays and abstentions and take the rest as yes votes. I will call for the votes in turn by jurisdictions. For the informational items, I will have the presenters complete their briefing and then invite questions, comments, also in turn by jurisdictions. I do want to adhere to the schedule and conclude the meeting on time, so I request all to be mindful of the time during your comments and questions. Lastly, a friendly reminder to mute your microphones always and importantly to unmute your mic and state your name jurisdiction when you speak. Lynn, if you would please take the roll call and confirm we have a quorum. Sebesky, I'm glad to note uh, Chair Allen has just joined us. Even better. <laughs> and that is who I was going to start with. So, um, Chair I was Allen. Just gonna, I was just going to second everything that Pam just said. Uh, yes. <laughs> Okay, great. Thanks. So I will I will continue. Roll call. Mr. Allen, you are counted as present and counted for. Um, Ms. Pinto, District Council. Hi, this is Ella Hansen for Councilmember Pinto. Great, thank you. Uh, District Council, Christina Henderson. District Office of Planning. Kristen Culkins is here. Thank you. District Department of Transportation. Mark Rawlings is here. Thanks, Mark. Moving on to Maryland. City of Bowie. Charles County. Charles County. Jason Groth is here. Jason Groth is here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, College Park. Uh, College Park. Denise Mitchell. Denise Mitchell. Denise Mitchell. So everyone can make so sure they everyone mute. can make sure they mute. Except who's except jurisdiction I call that would be helpful. Thanks. Frederick County. Uh, Jan Gardner's here and Mark Mishler as well. Great, thanks. City of Frederick. Kelly Russell, present. Thanks. City of Gaithersburg. Dennis Senslinger, present. I don't believe Neil's on at this point. I'll, I'll keep an eye out for him. Uh, City of Greenbelt. City of Laurel. Mike Lowe's here. Thanks. Montgomery County Executive. Chris Conklin here. Thank you. Montgomery County Legislative. Evan Glass here. Thanks. Prince George's County Executive. Uh, Vic Weisberg is here. Thank you. Prince George's County Legislative. Councilmember Danielle Glaris is here. Great, thanks Danielle. City of Rockville. Tom Newton's here. Thank you. Tacoma Park. Casey Costick is here. Thank you. Maryland House of Delegates. Uh, Carol Krim alternate is here. Thank you. Maryland Senate. Maryland Department of Transportation. Earl Lewis with MDOT is here. Thanks, Earl. Yeah. Moving on to Virginia. On to Virginia. City of Alexandria. And I can get her Alexandria present. Thank you. Arlington County. Christian Dorsey is present. Thanks. City of Fairfax. Fairfax County. James Rodney Luss is present. Thank you. Rodney Luss serving as alternate for Walter Alcorn. Great. Thank you. Gotcha. City of Falls Church. Dave Schneider here. Thanks. Fauquier County. 
Evan Schellenberger here. Thank you. Loudoun County. Kristen Umstadt here. Bob Brown here. Got, gotcha. Thanks. City of Manassas. I'm Sebesky here. Thanks. Manassas Park. Jeanette Rischel here. Thanks. Prince William County. Wheeler here. Thanks. Okay, here. And got gotcha you both. Great. Thanks. Virginia House of Delegates. Delegate David Reed present. Thank you. Virginia Senate. Virginia Department of Transportation. Then I saw a chat that they were having some connection issues, so we'll keep an okay, eye out. Keep an eye out. Great. Thank you. Wamada. Mark Phillips here. Great. Thank you. And we'll move on to our ex officio, Federal Highway Administration. Sandra Jackson, Federal Highway is here. Sandra, Federal Transit Administration. Dan Koenig, Federal Transit Administration. Thanks. National Capital Planning Commission. Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority. And National Park Service. That concludes roll call. We have a quorum. And for those of you I missed, I will keep an eye out in the chat and the participant list. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if I can just say this is Julia Coster with uh, the National Capital Planning Commission. Gotcha. Thanks, Julia. Thanks. And this is Norman Whitaker with VDOT. If Maria has not logged in yet, I'm on. Thanks, Norman. And this is Christina Henderson with DC. Great, thanks. And this is Neil Harris from Gaithersburg. Perfect. Anyone else? Excellent. Thanks, Lynn. All right, next, uh, and again, Pam, thank you so much for getting us started. Um, as always, we start with a review and adopting the minutes of our previous meeting. So that was October 20th. I'm going to make a motion to adopt the minutes of our October 20th meeting. Um, and so, so moved. And let me ask if there's a second. Pam Sebesky, second. Thank you, Ms. Sebesky. Um, so next, uh, everyone has, hopefully has a chance to review the minutes. Are there any corrections or comments on the meeting minutes before I move to a vote? Not hearing any. Uh, then again, what we do, it, just as a quick reminder, uh, as I'm going to go through call by jurisdiction, uh, nays or abstentions only, your silence is uh, in, inferred to be a yes. So uh, those voting, District of Columbia, Maryland, Virginia, and WMATA and the other agencies. All right, thank you very much. Record reflect a unanimous vote on the minutes. Uh, next, we're going to move to a technical committee report. We have a written summary. Oh, wait, Lynn. Hello. Sorry. Um, yeah, so we neglected to put the public comment part from item one on there. So if you don't mind, I'd like to go back to item one so I can reflect the comments that we received. Lynn, that's a wonderful suggestion. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let me turn Lynn to you now to help reflect yeah. uh, and summarize any public comments that we received. Yes, thank you for allowing me to interrupt. Anyway, all right, so for the November 2021 TPB meeting, the TPB received a total of three comments that were emailed to us. A memo with a summary of the comments, as well as the comments themselves, can be found on our TPB meeting page. Two of the comments were emails from the same person who forwarded an article on how expanded highways induce demand and create additional traffic. And she also shared a quote from the West Montgomery County Citizens Association regarding their goal and vision for the county. The third comment was a letter from the Coalition for Smarter Growth, which states that the TPB's FY 2023 Unified Planning Work Program should include staff time to do the following, to develop actionable climate proposals, to conduct detailed scenario analysis, to enhance modeling and forecasting, and to improve public outreach. So as I mentioned, all comments are found on our meeting page. I hope you all take a, take a few minutes to look at them. That concludes my report, Chairman Allen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now we will move to our technical, technical committee report. So you have a written summary of the November 5th meeting. Um, I hope everyone has a chance to read that. Uh, let me recognize Chair Jason Groth uh, to help highlight uh, any of the aspects of the committee's work, and then we'll turn to questions after that. Jason? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so the technical committee meeting was held on November 5th 
And um, there are several items that I won't go over that are on today's agenda uh, because you'll hear them straight uh, from the horse's mouth. A uh, couple of informational items. I just want to just let you know that we heard um, that are some things you may hear in the future, um, and, and uh, many of them were particularly interesting. Um, we heard uh, an in-depth analysis, sort of a deeper dive on the regional travel survey, which is a once in a decade uh, analysis of travel habits uh, in the region. And uh, while the, the numbers are pre-pandemic, uh, the, the, the analysis was pretty, pretty interesting. So um, I encourage you to look at the technical committee's portion of the COG TPB webpage and, and look over these uh, presentations are pretty interesting. Uh, another one was the blue, orange, uh, silver or BOS line analysis. Uh, that's a capacity and reliability study that was being done currently by WMATA that's in the um, sort of the earlier stages. Um, Heard a briefing on the uh, Street Smart uh, campaign for FY21, the results and the planned actions for uh, the fall. And then uh, also the regional um, TDM recovery marketing campaign, uh, basically a marketing outreach campaign to nudge commuters back into using alternative modes of transportation. Uh, also uh, a pretty interesting um, effort. So uh, when you get an opportunity, please take a look at those. If you have any questions for me, I'm here to uh, here to help. So thanks very much, Mr. Chairman, back to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Groth. Uh, any questions uh, for Mr. Groth? I don't see any. All right, uh, well then let's move to our next item. Thanks again, Mr. Groth. Uh, we'll move to our community advisory committee and access for all advisory committee reports. Uh, let me start with a report on the community advisory committee's meeting. I believe we have a copy of Elisa Walton's written report. And Elisa, let me turn to you if there's uh, some elements that you'd like to highlight. Uh, hello, this is uh, Rob Jackson. I'm a former chair of the CAC in 2019. I'm filling in for Elisa today who had a, uh, a conflict. Um, we talked about, uh, had a good meeting. We talked about the um, Street Smart campaign and the Voices of the Region focus groups. Uh, we also discussed climate uh, change and brainstorm ideas for strengthening the relationships between the board and the CAC. I'd like to highlight just our discussion about uh, uh, public outreach and climate change and strengthening our relationship with the uh, the board. Um, we uh, had a presentation on the uh, climate uh, change findings from the two voices of the region. And uh, uh, we found that uh, or the, sur the survey found that people do believe that uh, the human impacts uh, affect climate change, and we got some some quotes. While a lot of people would like to make change a priority, uh, sometimes uh, other factors make it difficult to do. We split into two groups and answered two questions. Uh, one is, why is there a disconnect between people recognizing it's important to take action to curb climate change while struggling to make climate change a priority when they make decisions for themselves? And there's just a lot of decisions. Key among them are uh, cost and affordability and um, uh, a feeling that there needs to be more direction from uh, elected officials. Education is important. There's a skepticism, certain skepticism among some people that uh, some uh, big players are, uh, are playing both sides of the, of the table, so to speak. They make money when the environment is harmed, but they also make money uh, on efforts to limit greenhouse gases. It, it, it sort of uh, discourages people from participating. Uh, a lot of people are still struggling to get to back from uh, lives back to normal from COVID. And uh, it's important to, uh, uh, to be patient with folks, but, but keep on educating the public. The second question we talked about is how could input from public officials, um, members of the TPB and um, um, CAC affect outreach, and uh, it's very important to find to meet people where they are, and that uh, information needs to be packaged in a way that it's easy to read and understand by the various diverse communities in our our our, uh, our region. Uh, we should include uh, anticipated outcomes and concrete recommendations when you share the results of public outreach, and when collecting input from the community and sharing that input. Uh, it's important to have a trusted person or group in the process. Uh, people are, are somewhat reluctant sometimes to jump in when they don't know anyone uh, who's involved with the project. 
And then we had a good discussion about how we can make our relationship between the CAC and you folks at the TPB stronger. Uh, we get two more, two main themes came out of this discussion. Um, we want more training information so that we can feel prepared and empowered to interact with our elected officials. Uh, important, they felt information about the purpose of the CAC and the role the TA, TPB plays is important. Um, and that's uh, that's something we all need to work on. And second, we feel that it's important to have an opportunity for CAC members to meet with our local elected officials and I guess state agency officials who have decision making uh, responsibilities for transportation. Uh, we'd like to be able to explain our role in also, but learning about uh, the you folks' approach for uh, coordination and coordinating local plans and regional priorities. And that was the highlights of our meeting, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Jackson, and thanks for stepping in. Uh, let me see if there's any questions uh, from our jurisdictions. Any questions from Amada or any other agencies? Virginia? Maryland? And the district? All right, not hearing any. Thank you very much, Mr. Jackson, again, for helping step in there and that summary. My pleasure. It's good to be back talking to you folks. Absolutely. Good to see you. Uh, next, let me recognize our colleague, Kanik Aguirre, who chairs our the November Access to All Access for All Advisory Committee's meeting. Uh, again, everyone has a written report, but uh, Kanik, let me turn to see if there's uh, elements you want to highlight for us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so again, we, we met uh, on November 12th and had a couple of agenda items. Uh, the first one was a presentation from Mr. Matthew Mohebi on Rights to Health, which is a pilot project uh, to basically improve transportation for end-state renal di disease uh, dialysis patients. And it's basically through a platform that helps to coordinate all the different stakeholders, uh, whether it's the hospital, uh, the patient's experience in the ride, um, making sure that they're getting there on time and that everybody knows where they are uh, during during transit and everything, uh, I, I, you know, I, transportation for health is so important, and I think this is another component of, of paratransit that warrants a greater conversation uh, in the region. And I'm hoping that next year we can kind of begin to broach some of this because it is such a, a complex network of of transportation elements, if you will, that kind of help people get to and from uh, their health visits. So um, looking forward to opening that discussion up next year a little bit more. Uh, the second item that we had was uh, a very robust presentation from Matthew Johnson from Montgomery County Department of Transportation. He briefed us on the planning and designing streets to be safer and more accessible for people with vision disabilities. Uh, they've put together a very nice toolkit. It's definitely worth checking out. If you have time and want to see some of the strategies. Uh, lots of good stuff in there on how to better engage people with vision disabilities, as well as uh, the planning and design process. Uh, to identify issues with current roadway and sidewalk designs and recommendations on how to make those roads and sidewalks sidewalks easier and safer to navigate. So, like I said, uh, definitely recommend checking it out if you have time and uh, there's going to be a link available to, to be able to see uh, that. And then also highlighting that part of what Montgomery County was able to do was uh, thanks to a technical assistance grant that uh, TPB was doing. So shout out to staff for helping out with that as well. Uh, and then the last item that we covered was also the climate change mitigation study of 2021 by Ms. Erin Morrow. Uh, I had a, a brief conversation about that, uh, just seeing what's going on. And uh, from other business, the only thing I kind of wanted to highlight was uh, what you guys have actually done in DC with scooters, which was to um, make sure that the scooters are locked and not left on sidewalks. And the only thing that the AFA membership wanted to, to make sure that everybody was aware of, and I actually let my colleagues in the city of Alexandria know because we just passed something recently for scooters as well, uh, was that it created some unforeseen issues. So when the, the scooters are being locked up, sometimes they're taking up uh, bike rack space or they're getting locked up to bus stops. And so the, when they're getting locked up to bus stops, it's impeding uh, folks with disabilities should be able to get on the bus or to recognize where the bus stop is. So just wanted to, to highlight that very quickly for everyone. Then the last thing is that uh, we still need to decide on some dates for 2022, uh, but I'll be meeting with uh, TBB staff uh, later on in December to try and figure out uh, what uh, the calendar will look like for 2022. And uh, with that, that's the end of my report and welcome any questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Gure. 
Uh, let me see if there are any questions um, first from the district. I'll just make one quick comment. Uh, when you, my ears perked up when you talked about the scooter uh, lock two requirements, I'll say the experience in the district um, has been uh, people have been starting to lock them up to people's uh, front gates and front fences. Uh, people are locking them to trees. Uh, I think some unintended consequences here uh, because there's a lack of the available uh, secure parking spaces for people to lock them to. So um, certainly something that we can learn from each other in different jurisdictions about what's working and what's not working there. Thanks. Uh, any questions from Maryland? Virginia? Yes, I have my hand oh, up, sorry. Mr. Chairman. This is Delegate oh, Krim. Delegate Krim, uh, yep. Thank you. So my question is for Maryland, there's uh, $1.7 billion in the infrastructure bill for public transportation. Um, are you developing a advocacy campaign for paratransit from some of that money? That's my question. Uh, Conti, can I throw that to you? Uh, just, can I just clarify? Uh, yeah. Was the question to the access for all committee in terms of how are they looking at or evaluating um, spending programs or were you asking if if TPB was creating something, I guess I didn't quite understand. But maybe Conti can help on that front. Well, either either one. I just think that there should be an advocacy program to tap into some of that money that's coming through the infrastructure bill. So if Conti wants to respond, that would be great. Right. Um, as part of my report, I was going to allude to a summary that staff has developed on what is in the 1.2 trillion dollar infrastructure bill. There is funding uh, for existing programs at slightly increased level for some programs. There is funding for brand new programs. We anticipate the federal agencies, whether it is FTA or whether it is federal highway, we anticipate uh, detailed rulemaking and program guidelines coming out. Uh, and when they do, uh, there will be opportunities through the TPB various committee structures uh, to promote uh, any collective or individual actions to go after uh, any competitive grant funding or any enhanced funding. I'm sure that the state and local transportation departments and uh, transit agencies uh, are all uh, also looking into the bill. Um, this is unprecedented amount of funding uh, for infrastructure in general, particularly for transportation. And, and hi, Conti, this is Earl Lewis with MDOT. Yes, the transportation agencies are obviously aware and we're gonna be looking at this in a, from a lot of different angles. And and the, the question that we got from Delegate Krim are similar to questions we're getting from a lot of stakeholders. So we, we're, you know, we, we see the big dollar amount, but also the federal agencies, as Conti said, have to flesh that out for us also to a great degree in terms of how they're gonna administer it, um, you know, the, the direct allocations to various states or transportation agencies, as well as any type of grant programs they're going to have and and what the process is going to be for entities to apply for that funding as well um, for for, you know, mobility and other activities related to transportation. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I just bring that up because uh, paratransit always seems to be at the bottom of the list for getting funding. And uh, we do have these issues in Frederick County uh, about getting our uh, paratransit riders uh, to their appointments. So um, uh, I would say that, uh, Mr. Lewis, <laughs> I would say, let's move paratransit up to the top of the list uh, instead of at the bottom of the list because those uh, people are truly in need of this service. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair. Hey, thank you, Delegate. Um, yeah, Mr. Gary. Uh, yeah, and you know, I, I mentioned after the first item that I think as a region, we need to have a larger discussion around paratransit, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to broach that topic next year. Um, it's like I said, it, there's so many different elements and it's so complex when we're talking about folks that need a much easier system to operate. And so I think if there's willingness among the localities across the region 
to try and standardize and, and bring things kind of under control a little bit more so it's a, a smoother, a smoother, more efficient ride. Um, I, I think if there's money for that, then we definitely need to invest the money in it. But part of the issue is we don't even know how some of this web works sometimes. Um, if you were to go to locality to locality, each person would say something different to you. But I, I think it would be worth this body's time to take a look at that and say, well, how is it working in each, not just in each state, but even within each locality and see what are the best practices and see how we can start trying to shift that across the entire region. Thank you. All right, I think I had gone through uh, the district of Virginia and Maryland. Let me just see if there were any questions from WMATA or any other agencies. All right, and not hearing any. Uh, again, thank you, Mr. Aguirre, for the report out. Uh, next, let's turn to our agenda item number five, our steering committee actions and report of the director. Again, we've got a written summary of the November 5th steering committee meeting uh, in the report, but Conti, let me turn to you for an update as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Just one item in the packet that I would draw your attention to and a couple of uh, new items to brief you on. On page 14, uh, 14 of my memo, you will see a copy of the letter from the TPB uh, to Amanda's uh, general manager, Paul Wiedefeld about uh, a study to redesign WMATA's bus service. You will recall that uh, the board during discussions last month heard from WMATA's representative Sean uh, that uh, a network redesign work had been scoped and funded but had not yet begun. So this letter essentially urges WMATA to start that uh, bus network redesign at the earliest. And um, also, a listing of the board meetings for next year has been posted on the website. We will make it available next month as well. So if you want to populate your calendars, uh, that'll be great. Um, now, a brief report on two other topics that are not part of my memo. First, I'm happy to report that we held our uh, in-person launch for the fall street, safety, safety, uh, street Smart Safety Campaign on Thursday, November 4th. Uh, I want to thank Prince George's County and their staff for hosting the event in Oxon Hill. Um, relatives of the crash victims, law enforcement officials, and transportation officials from throughout the district, Maryland and Virginia, uh, gathered and they shared some stories. Um, WTOP and a bunch of other TV uh, outlets covered the event. And also, I want to, following this event on Tuesday, November 9th, uh, Street Smart held a virtual best practices in pedestrian enforcement seminar for particularly for its law enforcement partners who will be carrying out operations aimed at motorists who fail to yield the right of way to pedestrians in crosswalks. So that was very well attended. And one additional special thing to note is starting on November 15th. The Street Smart campaign is bringing its lives shatter on impact. The testimonial exhibit, which is testimonials from uh, parents uh, or, or relatives of uh, people killed you know, on the roadways, um, it is bringing this exhibit to Union Station for a week long installation. And this is to precede the November 21st uh, World Day of Remembrance for road traffic victims. So second topic that I want to brief you on, you may, you are all aware that uh, in a special event this past Monday, uh, President uh, signed the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. The bill uh, proposes federal investment totaling about 1.2 trillion in several sectors over the next uh, five to eight years. There are several features of this bill that is unprecedented. Like I said earlier, the amount of money certainly is unprecedented. This wide array of infrastructure sectors that it covers, uh, the emphasis on equity and uh, resiliency and climate change are all new features. Uh, staff has put together a high level summary of the bill. I will note that the bill is about 2,700 pages long. It was very tough read. And it is in very legislative legalese, um, but it is being examined and understood by many government agencies, trade associations. So, so the staff memo is the staff's best understanding and interpretation of what is in the bill and also taking advantage of some of the other analysis from 
national level organization. So this memo is just a point in time summary. Um, but I would draw your attention to that. Uh, the memo uh, is more focused on funding within transportation. Just a few general observations, if I may. Uh, this is not a one time stimulus funding. Rather, this is a program, ongoing program with up to eight years of funding to come. And the 1.2 trillion is not all new money. $650 billion of this is to support programs that were pre existing. For example, the transportation program, the FAST Act, had expired. We were operating on a continuing resolution that has now been reauthorized all the way through the end of 2026. So that means funding for the basic transportation program, highway and transit, and FAA and FRA had to be provided. So all of that constitutes about 650 billion. But there is an additional 550 billion in new funding, all of which will flow through some federal agency. Um, so these federal agencies will have to develop detailed program guidelines and and come up with that, which, which we assume will be uh, coming forth in the next uh, few months. Equity actions, equity and actions we can take to mitigate climate change are predominantly uh, woven into many aspects of the funding, which jives very well with the priorities that the TPB has identified. Um, there is also a considerable amount of new funding that will be distributed on a formula basis. And that means every state and the District of Columbia will be guaranteed to get a minimum amount of money. So that's a good thing. Uh, then there is a considerable amount of money that will be made available through new competitive grants. That's a good opportunity for our members to either work individually to go after those grants um, or to work collectively on some regional priorities. So as those competitive grant programs are developed and more information becomes available, staff will keep the board briefed. A White House a state level fact sheet uh, has identified the amount of funding that the three states in our region can anticipate. Uh, and that is a significant amount, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's about uh, $20 billion over the next five years that this region can expect to receive through this bill. Uh, so in the last thing I wanted to just add to uh, Delegate Krim's point, as part of uh, enhanced funding for existing programs, we do have something called enhanced mobility uh, program. Later on today, the board will be approving a set of projects for about $6.6 .6 million. That program has not only continued to be authorized, but we anticipate there to be a slight increase in the amount of funding for that as well. Uh, so there will be that sort of dedicated formula funding, but I understand Delegate Krim's point, the, the issue, and as uh, Mr. Aguirre said, uh, the issue here is re-examining and re-visualizing how um, that form of transportation is provided, the demand responsive transportation uh, is provided and is designed throughout the region. That's a brief uh, uh, deviation from my uh, prepared remarks, Mr. Allen, and that concludes my report and I'm happy to answer questions. Absolutely, thank you so much, Conti. Uh, let me first start with WMATA and any other agencies for questions for Conti? Let me turn to Virginia. Maryland. And the district. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. I have a question. I just didn't uh, yes. mute myself from Virginia. Yes, please go ahead. Okay, in the bill, in the in the bill that passed, there's a section in there called. It's very interesting. It's called Section 107, Member Designated Project Authorizations. We had different names for it way back when, but is that is that real? I mean, I, you know, they're they're basically it's designating. A funding for a number of projects, specific projects, not you know, so it would go to those projects. Is that did that pass? Is that part of the infrastructure bill? Um, Bob, I will have to look at the uh, the bill itself to confirm. But what I do know is in the latest uh, 
federal fiscal year appropriations, uh, the, the Congress did have what in the past used to be called earmarks, but these were congressionally designated projects that each um, member of the Congress would designate. And there were some, some framework rules to follow. Uh, so that, so those were, that those were passed this year. Yeah, those were on the appropriation bills. Right. This is in the actual. This is in the actual um, House bill that that I seems to be the one that went into law. Anyways, I'm just curious. I've heard different things about it. There's a lot of money designated for a lot of different projects in our region, um, specific projects. So whatever help you could give me on that, I appreciate. Thank you. Sure, we'll look into that. Thanks. All right, excellent. Any other questions? I think for Conti. All right, Conti, thank you very much. Uh, next, let me turn to item six, the chairman's remarks. First off, uh, let me go ahead and wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving next week. I know that anybody who's been on TVB knows that this is the Thanksgiving meeting where we get the absolute best lunch ever. So um, next year, we will see you at Thanksgiving uh, TPB. So Conti, we're expecting that Thanksgiving feast next year. Uh, but everyone has a wonderful and safe time with friends and family. Uh, next month will be my last meeting as chair as we wrap up the year. And so I'm going to save some of my final thoughts for then. Um, but I do want to note, as we talked about a little bit today, with the President's Infrastructure Investments Job Act uh, signed this past Monday, it's absolutely historic action by our federal government in quite some time. Uh, it's not just the amount of new funding that's being made available that's noteworthy. I think it's the breadth of the sectors that the new investments will be going into and the fact that it's not just a one-time stimulus bill. The bill is providing funding for a number of topics that this TPB has been working on, uh, maintenance and state of good repair for our bridges and transit system, roadway safety, addressing climate change within the on-road transportation sector, especially our electric vehicles, reconnecting our communities by removing or mitigating physical infrastructure barriers, including within communities uh, to improve accessibility and facilitate economic development. The coming years, I think it's just a, an amazing opportunity for each of us to pursue this record amount of new funding to implement projects and programs and supports to advance these regional priorities individually within our own jurisdictions, but then also collectively as a region. And many of these new funds are through competitive grants, so we improve our chances when we combine our resources and collectively go after many of those grants. Uh, a couple of quick announcements to make, though. Um, first, I will be convening a couple of our colleagues as a nominating com uh, committee to bring to the board a slate of candidates for the position of chair and two vice chairs for next year. Let me go ahead and thank in advance Christian Dorsey from Arlington County and Bridget Newton from the city of Rockville for graciously agreeing to join me on this committee. We're going to put together a great slate for you of candidates uh, for next month. And on our second announcement earlier this year, we had challenged our staff to identify pathways through which the region can reduce its on-road greenhouse gas emissions to help the region meet its short-term and long-term greenhouse gas reduction goals. We were recently briefed on this work. Next month, we will have the results of all the analysis completed. I want to make sure that members have enough time to obviously learn about the results, have their questions uh, about the analysis and results addressed before we then engage how, um, how this can help the board in the coming years to have these strategies implemented. So since we do have several other business items that we'll have to work on, uh, we're not going to have a lot of time during the regular board meeting next month. And this kind of lends itself to that type of uh, working group anyway. So I've accepted the staff's recommendation, recommendation to hold a technical work session to get more time to learn about the climate change mitigation study that we just completed. Uh, during that work session, members will receive all the results of the analysis. We'll have a lot of opportunity to have questions uh, addressed about the analysis. And then during the regular meeting on Wednesday, uh, my hope would be that we're able to still have a healthy discussion, but we'll have a lot of those questions and concerns that can be addressed during that work session, uh, which will help use our time very efficiently. Um, and we can also then use that some more times examining what these results mean for the future transportation decisions in making uh, the type of investments and the ways in which DPP can assist the region in their implementation. So if you uh, do not have that date already, let me make sure everyone has it. Please hold December 13th, Monday, December 13th, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. for a virtual work session. And we'll have staff make sure that they follow up with everybody. So with that, let's turn to our action items of the day. I'm going to turn to item number seven which is enhancing regional roadway safety enforcement. This is the first of three action items on our agenda today. I'm gonna to start by thanking the steering committee for indulging uh, my proposal for this item at its November 5th meeting. I'd spoken about this during the board's October meeting as well. One of the topics that this board has been very active 
uh, consistently over several years on the topic of roadway fatalities and serious injuries. Our resolution adopting roadway safety targets has clearly noted our dissatisfaction on the state of roadway safety in our region. And we spent quite a bit of our time and money conducting a detailed roadway safety study. We've identified a comprehensive set of strategies to improve roadway safety. And earlier this year, we approved our first set of planning grants to help develop ideas uh, and programs, policies that help improve roadway safety. In all this work, we've recognized enforcement as one of the important strategies. Unsafe driving behavior on the roadways must be monitored and safety laws enforced. If not, our roads will not be safe. In this region with three states and many localities and drivers constantly crossing state lines, different legal authorities enforcement can be a challenge. The good news is that the three states belong to a national compact where we assist each other with traffic enforcement. The issue is that this compact does not cover enforcement of citations issued by automated traffic enforcement devices. Unsafe drivers in this region are taking advantage of this by being repeat offenders, racking up fines, in some cases, tens of thousands of dollars of fines, and not paying them. In some cases, you can track someone's commute by the serious violations and speeding that just continues to go unabated. Um, the issue, the uh, unsafe drivers in this region, as I said, are taking advantage of this. In other words, they're not feeling the consequences of their unsafe and dangerous actions on the roadways because these automated traffic enforcement citations are just simply not being enforced. I believe the TBB has made roadway safety a priority and it should write to the governors uh, of Maryland and Virginia and the mayor of District of Columbia to work together to establish interjurisdictional reciprocity of automated enforcement citations to improve regional traffic safety. A draft of such a letter has been provided to us. I think the staff's done a great job of grounding this letter in road safety, which is a high priority for TPB. Uh, if there is no enforcement, there's no deterrent for the unsafe driving. So while fines are a deterrent, regional reciprocity on ATE citations is not about collecting fines for the sake of just adding revenue. We should be, uh, we should include a conversation about equity when it comes to collecting our fines for, uh, for sure, but this is about ensuring road safety throughout the region. Um, so I think there may be a bit of discussion about the letter. Um, so let me uh, move first to approve the letter. If we have a second, then what I'll do is I'll turn to discussion uh, before we then decide our, our next action. So with that, let me move approval of the letter and see if there's a second. Second, Snyder. Thank you, Mr. Snyder for the second. Okay, so now we have the draft letter on the table in front of us. So let me turn to see if there are any comments, uh, questions, or uh, discussion. And let me first turn to the, I'll do it by jurisdiction. Um, and so I'll start with the District of Columbia. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is uh, Councilman Henderson, <laughs> your colleague here. Um, uh, thank you so much. And I wanted to just express a thank you to the staff um, for uh, drafting this letter. Um, as you know, you know, we, this has been something that we have struggled with mightily in the district of Columbia, as we've had a number of, uh, fatalities due to traffic violence, uh, this year, especially of young children. And so, um, I really appreciate, um, and would encourage, um, our colleagues here on the TPB to, um, approve this letter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments from DC? to Virginia. Uh, I see Mr. Dorsey's hand. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on the merits, <clears throat> excuse me, on the merits of this, I fully support it. Uh, I think clearly we have a, uh, a de facto loophole with our uh, enforcement of our traffic laws. And as we consider perhaps more uses of automated tools to promote equity, efficiency, and fairness, I think it's only natural that we explore this area. Uh, so on the merits, I have absolutely no qualms with uh, what has been offered via resolution and via letter, but I do have a concern about process and I'd ask for everyone to consider that we take advantage of this opportunity to, uh, you know, fully discuss the issue uh, to the extent that we need to, but for the action to be to ask each jurisdiction to weigh in in a manner of their own choosing um, before we ask the TPB to send a letter to our, the respective chief executives of our of our region. Uh, for the purposes really of the principle, I, I want uh, to make sure that the TPB doesn't exclude uh, jurisdictional voices in engaging in direct appeals with those chief executives. I wanna make sure that that's fully uh, backed, endorsed and informed by uh, us as local jurisdictions. So, in, in my mind, it could take the form of, of really whatever a jurisdiction may want. 
it can just authorize a TPB representative to do what it needs to do on a jurisdiction's behalf. We could see letters uh, coming forth from the jurisdictions or resolutions, depending on what it is they prefer. I just know for me in Arlington, I want to make sure that this process that the governors engage in includes us at the table to ensure that uh, the principles for effectively uh, designing this reciprocity agreement are put in play. Thanks, Mr. Dorsey. Uh, if I can, I might ask a question to make sure I understand. Maybe I'm not quite following what you're recommendation here is oh so so my ultimate recommendation is today for us to defer consideration of the letter um and i would ask that we uh come back in december armed with jurisdictions um who want to have the opportunity to offer a letter or a resolution in support of this effort before we go ahead and authorize the release of a letter to the chief executives of maryland virginia and the district Okay, um, I guess I'll, I'll respond briefly, but then I certainly want to open it up for other discussion. Um, the intent behind the letter is to encourage our chief executives of our three jurisdictions um, to work together to find a solution. Not that TPB is the, and maybe I'm not hearing you correctly, but um, not that TPB needs to be the arbiter of exactly what that agreement between three jurisdictions. Oh, I understand. Okay. So before the TP, what I'm suggesting, and again, mm -hmm. this is a suggestion up to the board to consider on its own. Um, I believe that the jurisdictions should uh, weigh in in forming. Uh, I believe that the jurisdictions ought to weigh in um, and provide something uh, to inform the TPB that then goes ahead and engages in this relationship with the chief executives. I don't want the principle that the TPB is going to engage in direct relationships with the chief executives on, manner, on matters that fully affect its constituent jurisdictions. I'll just give you, I'll paint you a scenario that is not in any way applicable to this, uh, but you could have the TPB deciding that it wanted to pursue an agenda and engage the chief executives on an issue over the objections of affected jurisdictions and i don't want to establish any sort of precedent principle that that's the way we operate okay um i believe now let me certainly turn to others to to be able to to, to chime in here too the intent of our conversation from last month was that we recognize that each of us in all of our jurisdictions are experiencing um Significant traffic violence, uh, injuries, and fatalities. I, I, I think we're all on the same page there. Um, we also see that among our jurisdictions, individuals that are driving dangerously on, and I'm speaking regionally here, on each other's roadways, creating significant hazards um, and creating injuries and death, um, that we have a shared interest in making sure that if there's a DC driver doing harm in Virginia, I want them held accountable in the same way if I'm in the district and Virginia drivers driving dangerously in DC, they should be held accountable. So the action that we had talked about last month and the letter that we had wanted to put forward was to call on those executives to work together to find a solution. Um, I guess I'm having a hard time seeing how that is overly prescriptive about what that solution should be. That's that's not what I should that's okay, not what I, I, I I'm I'm having a hard time following you, Mr. Dorsey. Can okay, you... I'll I'll try again. Okay. Uh, fundamentally speaking, um, the jurisdictions have not weighed in on this issue um, in any official capacity. I understand the District of Columbia has. You've had a legislative process to determine that this is your local position, and you've determined what are the outcomes that you'd like to see from it. I have not had that opportunity in Arlington County. I don't know if others uh, have had that opportunity as of yet. I would like to have that opportunity before uh, we then authorize the TPB to beseech the chief executives to engage in this work. Thank you for that. I think I finally, I, thank you. I think I do understand what you're saying now is that you feel that your legislative jurisdiction has not authorized you to vote in support of calling for a, a unified enforcement? 
I feel comfortable that my particular jurisdiction would be fine with my making a decision to engage in this effort. I, however, do believe fundamentally that I would prefer that my jurisdiction's voice be a principal voice asking our governor to engage in this kind of relationship, not proxying that to the TPB. So I'd like to have my jurisdiction weigh in in support of this effort so that we are included um, as a, a key constituency when this reciprocity agreement is d discussed. Okay. First off, thank you for helping clarify. I do much better understand now what, what your concern is. Um, I know that there's probably others, so I'll, I'll just very briefly respond and then certainly kick it over to others. Um, I will say, I, I do think this is our part of our opportunity as a regional body of electeds and transportation officials to be able to lay out the key principles of what we want. I, I do not believe it would preclude in any way our individual jurisdictions being able to work with our our executives uh, to be able to um, advocate for what those solutions could look like or advocate for whether they, we believe they, they should move forward or not. Um, so I, I would definitely wanna draw in if there's other people who would like to have comments or questions on this, um, but it, I don't think I, respectfully, I don't think I agree that I, I think we should wait. Um, I do think it would be advantageous for us to be able to take action today. But let me also see where the body is and kind of get a sense from a discussion on that. Uh, I do see uh, Commissioner Glaros, I think I see your hand up. I think there was a few hands before me, but I'm happy to go first. I can imagine. I'm, I'm so, I can't see all the hands up, so I'm not sure yeah. where the others no, that's are. That's okay. I'm, I'm happy to wait. Um, I think um, Umstead was a little bit ahead of me and Sebesky. Got it. I, I, my screen only showed your hand up. I see no, okay. uh, Chris and Umstead, I see your hand up. Uh, Mayor Rischel, I see your hand up now. So let me go to uh, Chris and Umstead, then Mayor Rischel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we very much want to support your initiative um, and anything we can do to uh, to help you achieve this. I think we want to do our our concern in Virginia is that our legislation is is not necessarily compatible with DC's or even with Maryland's, uh, and for that reason, in addition to what um, my friend Mr. Dorsey put forth, we're not sure if we should support this today. On the other hand, if the body wants to um, authorize a letter, which is a very good letter uh, for your signature, and I appreciate you taking the initiative in this, we do have some recommended language that would acknowledge the difference in our legis in our legislation in our three um, jurisdictions and maybe help uh, reach a compromise so depending on what happens in the next few minutes uh, we can offer that if you would like but again we totally support your efforts we think they're very important and an excellent idea thank you okay okay thank you very much um and I guess you're not making motion yet, but I hear you prepping that as a possible motion for some language. Um, Mayor Rischel, let me turn to you. I see Pam Sebesky, I see your hand up. And then uh, Ms. Claros, if I have my order correct now, I'll come back to you after that. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Chair Allen. I appreciate the suggestion, but I think it adds an extra layer to the process that is not necessary. So I'm comfortable resolving this today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Sebesky. Thank you, Chair Allen. Um, I would like to, in, in the means of time, echo more of what um, Mr. Dorsey had to say. I think the merits of this are quite important. Um, safety and, and keeping people safe are very, very important, and that's the merits behind this. And yes, we did ask for this letter, and I do think it's a well-drafted letter, but um, in further consideration, I do think that we um, you know, and the difference in DC compared to Virginia and Maryland is that um, if we're going to go to the governor of Virginia, 
what gets passed is likely not going to affect just Northern Virginia. And so we definitely do need to make sure that our legislators and our jurisdictions are comfortable making, making um, people understand the importance of this initiative. Um, and we're having, we're going to be having a big change that we're asking this letter to go to to in Virginia in comparison to DC and Maryland. So I do um, support Mr. Dorsey's initiative to give a little bit more time um, and come back and vote on this in December. It, it's not like this, you know, all of our, all of this isn't gonna go forward until next year. And it gives us some time to do due diligence to make sure that what we're putting forward is representative of all constituency. Okay, thank you, Ms. Sebesky. Uh, now, Ms. Glaros, let me turn to you. And then I think I saw um, Ms. Russell, your hand go up. Sure, uh, thank you, Chair Allen, and appreciate the dialogue in front of us. Um, I think I might just suggest a few things for consideration. So one, at least from the Prince George's perspective, we are um, about to be in recess as a council session. So if the expectation is that all of the jurisdictions will have done a resolution before December, um, we will not be able to do that. In fact, the earliest we would be able to probably complete that is by late January. So I just want to sort of put that just as we're sort of dialoguing sort of what the possibilities might be. I may suggest if this is amenable to our Virginia folks, who I think are really the ones who are, and I appreciate why you guys are asking these questions, um, but I'm hearing they're also very much coming from my Virginia contingent here. Um, we may consider sort of um, going ahead and approving the letter today with the idea that um, we are um, approving it, but in essence, we don't need to send it out um, immediately. And that gives those jurisdictions who feel the need to also pass an additional resolution um, the opportunity to do that resolution and to send that um, off to the governor's office as well. So just trying to you know, keep this one moving. It's a pretty important one. We've been talking about it at TPB for a really long time. Um, and uh, I'd hate us to get sort of stalled um, too much in our process. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Claros. Uh, Ms. Russell, let me turn to you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to concur with Mr. Dorsey and Ms. Sebesky on, on the concerns that they have articulated. And I think we've probably heard from Virginia concerns because we were going by jurisdiction and Virginia was who was called on first. But, you know, in Maryland, uh, we do go jurisdiction by jurisdiction with our uh, with our automated enforcement and there are a lot of inconsistencies. And so I think um, taking additional time to sort of hash out some of those and, and allowing the jurisdictions to weigh in um, can't do any harm. We certainly don't have, you know, we are not forced to do this today. We can bring it back in December. I think, in, uh, you know, we all we all believe in, uh, you know, what we can do in terms of safety. This is an idea that we've been talking about for a long time. I think, you know, we we support it in principle. Just want to make sure that process wise, as was mentioned, um, you know, we sort of cross our T's and, and make sure that everybody feels that they have their voice, you know, heard. Okay, thank you, Ms. Russell. Uh, Ms. Kostick, I think I see your hand up. Thank you. Um, I don't have a particular um, view on, on the process aspect of this, but I did just want to note um, when we discussed the resolution um, that this is sort of refer referring to previously, I did vote against it based on a concern um, related to the primary seatbelt enforcement aspect. And so, although I support the general focus of this letter, I do intend to abstain from the vote um, on this when we do vote on it. Thank you. Well, let me do this. Uh, trying to always figure out if you can read a room. Um, so if enough of my colleagues in Virginia and Maryland um, are expressing concerns to different degrees, um, I will acknowledge that feels a, a little inconsistent from where I thought the conversation was a month ago. And in my perspective, the letter is talking about treating automated traffic enforcements, traffic violations, in the same way we would enforce traffic violations if they were handed out from an officer. Um, but I also see the unease colleagues in calling for that right now. Sounds like I hear colleagues saying they would prefer to wait a month and perhaps in between that time, we're able to work on a few issues. Um, I don't think um, that, it, to I think uh, Ms. Glaros's point, I don't think the request was that each jurisdiction would be seeking to pass resolutions um, 
because I don't think TPB would be very effective if we can't act unless each of our jurisdictions has passed resolution. But I don't believe that's what Mr. Dorsey was actually suggesting. I think it was about having conversations uh, internally first. So um, what I would suggest then um, to Conti and to our TPB staff is I will, I guess since I was the maker of the motion, I will withdraw this item um, and I would like to bring it back at our December meeting and use the intervening time between now and our next meeting to work with our colleagues. For those of you that did raise some concerns, you to please uh, help me think through what your concerns are and how we can frame that language up. Um, because if we do believe this is a principle worth fighting for and speaking to, I think we want to get this done and I think the urgency is there. So if that is amenable to everybody, I will withdraw the action item uh, from the agenda today with the intent to bring it back in December. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Dave Snyder is seconder. I support that. Yep, yep. Um, I do hope we'll work on final language and I plan to second um, action um, in December consistent with, as Christian Dorsey said, the merit of uh, what we're doing here. Um, I also, to the extent that we add language from Virginia, uh, we have extremely limited ability to engage in um, automatic enforcement. And um, frankly, we need much more authority. So at least in my view, whatever we say about the difference in authority in Virginia, we don't imply that we're all satisfied with the increased limitations in Virginia. So that would be all. I think, uh, Mr. Chair, I think you followed the, the right course here, but strongly in support of it, and I'll be in support of it in December. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Snyder. I appreciate that. Mr. Chair, this is Earl Lewis from MDOT. Yes, we, really, we really appreciate you taking the initiative on this. I would, I would second Mr. Snyder and Mr. Dorsey's comments and others. I think this is a good initiative. We might need to wordsmith it a little bit so we, we can all have as much support behind it as possible because obviously safety is job one and we need to do what we can to reduce speeding and red light violations. So I think we're all aligned on that. We're just trying to figure out how the letter can be as most effective at moving that ball forward. Got it. All right. I'm going to hold everyone to that, that we are going to vote on this on December. Uh, and let's, in the intervening weeks, uh, we will communicate and work on this. And uh, I look forward to putting it forward in front of us again in December. And thank you, Mr. Snyder is the second. All right, next, Lynn, let's move to our next agenda item, which is item number eight. All right, Chair Allen, section. I had a question second, on the last section. item. Oh. Uh, Mr. Conklin, yes. Would it be possible for TPB staff to develop a brief summary of automated enforcement practices within the COG region that might help us understand some of the issues and concerns uh, that individual jurisdictions may have? Sure. Let me turn to Conti to see from your perspective, Conti, uh, and we can certainly follow up after the meeting to kind of fine tune that a little bit. But is that from a capacity standpoint able to do that? We can look into just reporting who has what. For example, yeah. till last year's General Assembly session, Northern Virginia localities did not have the legal authority to install any of these cameras. So they don't have any. So there is no such thing. So uh, I think uh, if, if the interest is to look at who has what programs authorized our authority, that so we can try and develop that inventory. Uh, but I think the issues here are slightly beyond even once they are granted that authority, uh, how does one go about implementing this program in an equitable manner and what degree of uh, recourses are each jurisdiction willing to implement uh, to enforce? So I think that's that's really open ended because there is no uh, such program in yeah. place now. So. Yeah, I mean, I, if I can, it's again, this is not an issue of having jurisdictions install ATE where this is really we're again we're talking about enforcement that um, if we if we have traffic violations that our multiple jurisdictions have said are illegal and unsafe and dangerous activities um, yet we have no way to enforce them that's that is the the nut we are trying to crack here um, but I think to, uh, to Mr. Conklin we can follow up from the meeting to see what TPV staff are able to help share if that's a helpful item uh, and if that's okay, we'll we'll take it from there and then move on to our next item. Okay. 
All right, so let me turn to uh, item number eight on our agenda. So this is an important action where we are going to approve more than $6 million in funding to help transportation services to our older adults and people with disabilities. I believe that uh, we've all been briefed about the program last month, and now Lynn Winchell Mindy is going to present us with a set of projects recommended for funding. After Lynn's briefing, I'm going to make a motion to adopt resolution R5-2022. And then uh, after that, I'll look for a second, and then we can have discussion at that point. So Lynn, let me turn it to you to take away. And I'm actually going to turn it over to uh, Kenneck, who wanted to say a few words. Uh, yeah, sorry about that, Mr. Chair. Meant, meant to give you a heads up on that. Uh, just really quickly, because Lynn's going to have all the overview of this, I just wanted to take a second to thank uh, staff one more time for all the work that they put into this, as well as um, a review committee that spent many hours looking at all these projects to try and allocate some of this funding. As usual, uh, there was more funding requests than money on hand. But, uh, you know, we were making the hard decisions to see uh, where to allocate this money and, and with that, I'll throw it back to Lynn for this presentation. So, thank you. Thank you and I too would like to uh, thank the selection committee and also our chair Aguirre for his time as well as the TBB officers time in their reviewing this for concurrence as well. So, I'm going to talk about the projects recommended for funding. Under the enhanced mobility program, this was our 2021 solicitation. Next slide. I'll really briefly go over the program basics. I was here last month giving you um, kind of that presentation. And then we'll review briefly the 21 recommended projects for funding and then a request action on the resolution to approve the projects and amend the tip. Next slide. So we have approximately 6.6 .6 million in federal transit administration dollars for the program. We received 11.1 .1 million in requests. Um, for background again, we are the designated recipient for the DC, Virginia, Maryland urbanized area. And the program is intended to improve mobility for older adults and people with disabilities. Um, again, this is a unique role for the TPB in that we prioritize, select, and actually implement the projects with the help of, of COG as the administrative agent. Next slide. So, uh, the selection committee recommends funding 21 of 23 applications received. There were a couple that were not recommended for funding, and those organizations will receive um, information about how they might improve their application for future funding. So with the matching funds, the recommend pro recommended projects total over $9 million. And following um, today, with that approval we're looking for, we will amend the TIP to include the projects and then TPB staff will work on submitting them to FTA for final approval. Next slide. And actually, I'm gonna skip that one. So I'm going to give a, um, a broad overview by category of the types of projects that were recommended for funding. You have a memo in your materials that gets into more detail in the particulars. So the first group, there are seven projects for mobility management. And this includes things like travel training, options counseling, information on options that are available, and uh, volunteer driver support. Um, so Boat People SOS was one of those, Capitol Hill Village, next slide, Dulles Area Transportation Association, Fairfax County Neighborhood and Community Services, and next slide, Jewish Council for the Aging of Greater Washington, next slide, the Ark of Northern Virginia, and Opportunities, Inc. So those were the seven mobility management projects recommended for funding. Next slide. We had three projects that were specific to operating. Um, some were for accessible taxi operations, and then the other for technology to improve transportation for dialysis patients. So that is the next phase of the um, project that Mr. Aguirre mentioned in the AFA report today. Next slide. And the third project under that one is that transit group. I know, I, I'm sorry, I skipped. I forgot about DC Department of Four Hire Vehicles as well. That's an important one to mention. Next slide. The next group is for um, vehicle acquisition only. So only the vehicle and any capital items to support it. And there were two projects 
um, one for community based services and supports for people with developmental disabilities uh, for their participants and the other for older adults um, through Fairfax County. Next slide. The next group of projects are wheelchair accessible taxis and their operations. So we had three, um, three projects under here that were recommended, Liberty Transportation, Yellow Transportation, which are DC taxi companies, and then Regency Taxi in Montgomery County. Next slide. This next group was both capital and operating. And there were six projects in this group, and it's for um, vehicle acquisition and associated expenses related to tailored transportation for specific populations of older adults and people with disabilities. Um, so transportation to medical, community-based services and supports, and employment. So these are Chinese Culture and Community Service Center, Easter Seals serving DC, Maryland, Virginia. Next slide. Echo, next slide. New Horizons Support Services, the Arc of Prince George's County, and the Arc of Greater, uh, excuse me, the Arc of Greater Prince William County. Next slide. Oh, and we're at the end that quickly. <laughs> Um, so staff recommends approval of the of R5 2022 to approve the 21 projects for funding and to amend the TIP to include the projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lynn. All right, I'm going to make a motion then to adopt resolution R5 2022. I'm going to look for a second, and then after that, we'll turn to questions and comments. Second, Pam Sebesky. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sebesky. So it's seconded. Uh, so let me turn and see if there are any questions or comments by jurisdiction, uh, and then we will move to an action. So let me go in the opposite order I did last time. So let me go to WMATA, any other agencies? In Maryland? Virginia? And the district? All right, Lynn, that bodes well. All right, then let's take a vote. Uh, again, you're voting with a, either a nay or abstention. Your silence means that you are voting in support. So, uh, by jurisdiction, let me go to the District of Columbia. Maryland. Virginia. And WMATA, any other agencies? All right. Thank you much, everybody. Uh, that passes unanimously. Next, let's turn to agenda item number nine, which is the transit safety target approval. This is our last action item for today. Uh, we were presented with a draft of these federally required regional targets for transit safety performance measures last month. Now we're being asked to approve these before we adopt resolution R6 2022. Let me turn to Eric Randall to help us uh, again do a quick briefing on these targets, and then I'll make a motion to adopt the resolution and look for a second before we then turn to questions and comments. Uh, so Eric, let me turn to you. Afternoon, Mr. Chair, can you hear me okay? We sure can. All right, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I'm here to ask your approval of resolution R6-2022 to set the federally required targets for transit safety for the region for 2021. You were briefed last month on the federal requirements and how they apply and presented with the draft targets for comment and review. Since then, no comments were received on the proposed targets. One member of the board did ask how public safety incidents are recorded vis-a-vis -vis these targets. In general, the tar transit industry and the federal requirements attempt to distinguish between safety events and public safety or security inc incidents. The latter are not included in these targets or actual performance data for safety. So for example, an assault that led to a serious injury would not be included in these targets or the performance data. Uh, again, in the documents provided for this item, we have the resolution, we have a memo that summarizes the briefing last month, and then we also have the report that discusses these targets and also reviews uh, trends in the past year against these targets, if there are any questions for those. Otherwise, if there are any questions on this item, I'll be happy to take them, Mr. Chair. Otherwise, staff recommends approval of resolution R6 for this federal requirement. Thank you. 
Got it. Thank you, Mr. Randall. Uh, again, what I'm going to do is make a motion to adopt. Uh, hopefully there's a second and then we'll turn to questions and comments. So I move to adopt resolution R6 2022 to set regional transit safety targets. Is there a second? Second, Casey Costick to Common Park. Thank you, Ms. Costick. Um, all right, let me turn to see if there are any questions or comments for Eric. Um, let's see, what was my order last time? Let's try, we'll go around the other way. Uh, let me go to Virginia first. Uh, Mr. Snyder. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I wonder if COG staff could brief us to, to get to the bottom line here. Are we proposing performance which is better than the performance we're now having in terms of safety? And please explain what that is. Thank you. So, Mr. Snyder, uh, I'll be happy to take a, a crack at that question. I will say that these transit safety rules, which were part of the Fixing America Surface Transportation Act, only came into effect last year, essentially as the pandemic was striking. Um, so, I, I would say that at this point, there uh, many transit planners are still reconciling how to handle these targets versus performance, because of course, transit ridership was so impacted by the events of last year. Uh, I'm not sure planners really have a good handle on some of the trends and agencies were in many cases setting these targets or even tracking this data for the first time. Um, this is the targets we did adopt in 2020. Uh, the targets generally are more rigorous for most modes of operation, particularly for bus. I think planners do have a better handle on what's happening in terms of serious injuries on buses. Uh, however, the numbers are also revised downwards because planners expected uh, reduced service and reduced ridership this year. So I would say that this is an area of gradual improvement um, as people get more used to the target setting regimen as they implement the required agency safety plans, because the rulemaking goes way more than just setting targets. Agencies have to adopt safety plans. These are reviewed by FTA, et cetera, and so forth. Um, I, I think it's a learning experience. I would say, though, that the targets are getting more rigorous, um, but it, it's sort of a, an evolution that will probably take a couple of years to really uh, finalize out to the point where people, we really have a good handle on what's happening in the region trend wise. And FTA is certainly take, making every effort to disseminate best practices, lessons learned, and the industry as a whole is working cooperatively towards improving safety performance. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm not sure I understood totally what he just said. Um, maybe others did, but um, let me go back to the fundamental question. Are we pushing ourselves in terms of improving the safety record of transit in this area with these targets? Mr. Uh, Snyder, maybe um, I'll respond at a relatively higher level. The general answer is yes. Um, the that's what the federal regulations require us to do. But the federal regulations also puts a constraint in the sense that these targets have to be data driven, meaning it has to be based on actual data collected by these agencies for the previous set of years. So their aspirations and ambitions might be much better than the targets, uh, but they are forced by what the data shows is the trend coming in from, uh, from, from the data that they've collected. So within those constraints for transit this year, the targets are driven by data and they are continuing to improve. This is the second set of data targets that we will be setting. They may not quite match the aspiration of, um, you know, absolutely zero or, or towards the zero sort of thing. But we will probably get there is what Eric is trying to say. And this is the same story with the roadway safety as well. You all recall, you all almost did not pass the targets that we were we were recommending because you didn't want uh, a, a, a roadway safety target that did not have zero depth. Um, so so that's it's it's the same thing with with transit now. Yep. Okay, thank you, Mr. Snyder. Uh, let's see anything else from Virginia before I turn to Maryland. All right, let's go to Maryland. 
WMATA, any other agencies? Chair Allen, I, sorry, I just raised my hand. Yeah, um, yeah Ms. Costick. Uh, just a, a question and, and not for this time around, but I'm wondering, is it possible for us in the future to consider these targets and the general roadway targets at the same time? It, I just think it could be interesting and useful to kind of have that discussion where we're looking at both of them at the same time and to be able to kind of delve a little more deeply into the connections, because I assume some of these are also counted. Maybe they're not, but some of these are also counted in the roadway incidents as well and the targets there. So just wondering if there's any if there's a reason why we have to take them kind of at a different time of year, or if there is some potential to standardize that and do it all at the same time in the future. We can try. Originally, we were going to bring both um, this month, but there is typically a lag in the data that is collected and vetted and, and the targets that are set either by the transit agency or by the state DOTs because these are road, the roadway safety targets are set by the DOTs at the state level. So this is one of those years where, uh, we, where we thought we would be ready, but the data on the roadway safety was delayed. It is on this agenda for next month. I know we have just deferred one more item for next month, so I will try to bring the roadway safety next month. Thank you. Thanks. Ari Wamada, any other agencies? And District Columbia. All right, I don't hear any other questions or comments, so we're going to uh, move now to a vote. So again, uh, only asking for nays and abstentions. Silence means that you are in support. So let me start with the District of Columbia. Wamata, any other agencies? Maryland and Virginia. Snyder abstained. All right, thank you, Mr. Snyder. All right, thank you very much. Let the record reflect it was uh, Mr. Snyder abstained, but everyone else voted yes. So the measure passes. All right, we're next gonna move to our information items. Uh, we're gonna move to number 10, which is connected and automated vehicles, update on recent activities and review of draft regional principles. Um, this is the first of two informational items, um, a set of proposed regional principles for accommodating connected and automatic vehicles on our roadways and our railways. Staff's been working on this with several um, of our technical and advisory committee members. I will welcome Andrew Meese on our staff to review the set of draft CAV principles. As I understand it, we're gonna have an opportunity to provide feedback and then at a later meeting, we'll be asked to adopt these regional principles. So Andrew, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Chair Allen and members of the board. Uh, that was a, a very good introduction. So I'll go to the next slide uh, for the sake of time and delve right into what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, we've been uh, undertaking a process to strengthen our regional understanding of connected and automated vehicle impacts. Uh, and that's our path to developing a, a draft set of principles. Uh, and let me take one second that could take hours to talk about you know, the nomenclature behind connected and automated vehicles, self-driving cars, uh, you know, automation in vehicles, there's a whole range of capabilities and a whole range of vehicles that are either out there or could be out there in the future. So this is sort of a, a catch-all term, uh, but, you know, there there are differences in these vehicles and I, you know, uh, we didn't get into a lot of the definitions and there are engineers definitions and so forth, but there's um, something behind that. But uh, we did want to talk about outcomes and the, the outcomes that we would talk about would be ensconced in the principles that I'm going to present in a moment. So uh, in today's presentation, I'm going to talk about the approach and structure that uh, staff working with our uh, advisory committees used in putting together this draft straw man set of principles and uh, sort of an, an overview of the, the, the current set, which of course are, are up for, for comments and edits and so forth. And here you can see a list of the committees that we uh, we worked with, and I want to thank the, the time and attention given by the Access for All Advisory Committee and the Community Advisory Committee, as well as the TPB Tackle Committee and its advisory subcommittee on spot systems performance operations and technology. And once I go through them, then there'll be a little outlook at the end. Uh, next slide, please. So just a, 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 a note about Visualize 2045, because this is where we want to end up. We need to or, or there's a desire to be able to talk about CAVs in our long range plan. And yet, when you look at what we had in the plan 
uh, that was published in 2018, we really had limited information. And that's because there's many uncertainties that surround CAVs, you know, things like the global pay pace of technological development and market forces, what's gonna happen, whether people uh, uh, buy these things at a fast pace or a slow pace, or, you know, some of the more complicated things if they move to a, uh, a shared vehicle model instead of a, 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 an owner vehicle model. So a lot of, a lot of uncertainties. Uh, and, and that was the status as of 2018. So we've worked to strengthen our understanding of CAVs through a series of regional webinars that we had in 2020 and 2021. And very importantly, a consultant developed white paper on CAV planning considerations. So we brought our consultant team in with some expertise on some of the things that we needed to look at. So uh, again, the, 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 the important thing here is this is about what eventually appears in Visualize 2045. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, again, this white paper was published last year uh, by, you know, brought in by our, our expert consultant team. And it looked at um, particularly the areas where TPP goals, policies, and activities may substantially interact with uh, CAVs, uh, the deployment impacts, and the roles responsibilities. So the paper isn't an, uh, isn't an omnibus paper all about CAVs. It's about how C CAVs may impact what TPB and its staff have to do in, you know, in our job. So that's, that, that gives you sort of the context. Next slide, please. Uh, one of those things that it addressed was the, the roles that TPB would take. These are, you know, our areas of strength. There are a lot of different roles at a lot of different levels of government or, you know, international even, uh, you know, the, the, whether it's motor vehicle, uh, you know, uh, uh, equipment review and things like that. We, we have certain things that the TPB is going to really going to be focused in on. And certainly we can convene, we can uh, do information sharing and engagement. We had our webinar series, for example. And uh, uh, as I said, integrating this into Visualize 2045, but particularly where we are now is development of regional CAV principles for inclusion in Visualize 2045. Uh, next slide, please. This is a great slide and it. it's adapted from the white paper and it shows some of the major areas that CAVs might impact and the things that TPB uh, is concerned about and talks about. And you can see there's a wide variety of things. There's uh, three columns that are categories there and that's a, a convenience, travel impact, societal impacts, organizational impacts, whether you're talking about our modes of transportation, the way that people travel, what's happening to our environment and communities, uh, legal issues, and our operations kinds of issues, how we operate, how we forecast for the future. So there's a, a lot of things that, that we would have to consider and there's a lot of uncertainties. Um, so I think that led us to this thought that what we maybe wanna talk about is the desired outcomes as opposed to the uh, specific projects or specific, um, you know, activities. So that's that, that led us to uh, developing principles. That, again, the principles that would be end up appearing in this plan document. Next slide, please. So we as staff had an approach to putting together these principles. We said, well, what are what kinds of uh, of uh, statements has the TPB made in the past that are something along this line? And, and we took as a particular model, the 2016 freight plan, where there were some regional policies regarding freight. And, uh, you know, so that was that was a good model of the, the kinds of things, the, 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 way, the voice which, with, with which this would speak. Uh, we look, we're looking for brevity and positive phrasing. We wanted to stay within the TPB's purview. And this is maybe unusual or unique for this effort compared to when I listen in on other CAV uh, uh, meetings and activities and other agencies and so forth, where it's definitely not in the business of trying to promote or endorse CAVs or pave the way, nor at the other end of, of prohibition. We wanna talk about what, what is the outcome for communities? What's the, the safety and other kind of outcomes we'd like? Uh, try to look at things that would be evergreen. You know, you get these, these news reports about something that happened in one study or whatever, and they're very interesting, they're very important, but the technology may move on or the market forces may move on in a year or two. 
So we wanted to have something that was, was going to be ever, evergreen. And again, the focus on outcomes, not on strategies or tactics. So that, again, this is, this is the approach that staff took. These are the TBB principles. You will ultimately say what you want in, in these, but that was our, and of course it reflect our, our uh, stakeholders' comments that we received from our reviews over the several, last several months. They all have a structure. There's 18 of these principles, and they all start with this preamble, the deployment, use, or operation of connected and automated vehicles in the national capital region should, followed by each principle statement. So there's 18, and on the next slide, I'm gonna show you all uh, a sort of all 18 at a glance. Next slide, please. But for the sake of time, I'm certainly not gonna be able to talk about all these today, and you can see that this has a parallel to that chart I showed you er earlier with all those you know, important topic areas. We're trying to talk about outcomes in these uh, you know, topic areas, whether they be safety, equity, mobility, uh, access accessibility, our support of transit, um, environmental land use object uh, objectives, uh, prior uh, reduction of EMT, security, uh, goods movement, legal liability operations. So those things are all there. So just for the sake of time, I'm gonna look at eight of these in particular. Next slide, please. Ensure the safety of everyone on or near transportation facilities in all situations. Notice this is not just about drivers or passengers. Everybody around our transportation system, whether you're a pedestrian or bicyclist or whatever, is meant to be uh, you know, uh, encompassed in this draft principle. Next slide, please. Uh, equity is very important, obviously, to the TPB, and we, we wanted to make sure that these, uh, you know, this uh, stated that we were going to have a, a, an equitable benefit and no disproportionate negative impacts to any group or community. That's the outcome that uh, would be stated in these principles. Next slide. Uh, skipping ahead to four, uh, again, about accessibility, and we heard some good advice from the Access for All Advisory Committee. Uh, next uh, slide is the principle number six. Uh, the TPB has often stated that its priority is transit and the provision of transit. So we want to make it clear that, you know, CAVs are coming, that, that transit is still a priority for this region. Next slide, please. Um, uh, a whole lot packed in here, you know, TPB and our, you know, our partners at COG with, um, you know, a lot of effort on environmental objectives, land use objectives, decarbonization of the transportation system, and, you know, whatever outcome we have with CAVs, we want it to support these goals as well. Uh, next slide. Um, VMT, uh, there's some talk, of course, in CAV circles about whether you're going to have the same amount of vehicle miles of travel or more because of a lot of empty vehicles or perhaps perhaps less if if they're deployed right. Um, definitely want to say that uh, that 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 the uh, desired outcome would be less VMT. Next uh, would be the uh, next slide, please. Uh, this uh, was uh, of interest to some of the review committees, um, even though you know the, the the TPB is not about say motor vehicle law or something like that. Is we will have a world where vehicles have to interoperate, um, and they're on a system that have different users as well, and they have to do that safely, and that's a, a critical outcome here. And the last one I was going to highlight here is next slide number 16 was about the revenues and this d generated some discussion at the committee levels uh, the tpb has definitely in the past talked a lot about uh, transportation revenues and the costs needed and uh, uh, staff thought that it would be good to have something along the lines of saying that um, there has to be sufficient revenues or that, that, that they're, they can't be imposing undue costs that are you know, sort of uh, unfunded, if you will, that that the revenue structure has to reflect what it is that they're going to be bringing along. So that's a, a statement of that. Uh, next slide. There are, uh, you know, the others, the the other ten that I didn't um, uh, that I didn't go over are at the uh, back of this slide deck. You're certainly welcome to peruse those as well as the accompanying memo presented uh, for the information today. It's a straw man for ready for your ideas and we're ready and slated to return for approval at a subsequent meeting with the hopeful goal, of course, is next year, first half of next year, we're writing up the, the new 
plan document that this is going to be incorporated in the, uh, the section, the appropriate section that's talking about this. And with that next slide, uh, that concludes my remarks, uh, Chair Allen. And uh, if there's time, I'd be glad to take any questions or comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Meese. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes. Um, let me just make sure to, for all our board members to clarify here. Uh, we're not taking an action item next month on this. It is an action item in a few months out, probably maybe in the beginning of the new year, correct? Uh, it, I, I was sort of, you know, obviously, you know how the, the agendas go. Our, our assumption was January, but um, could be later than that. Okay. So how about we'll just say first quarter of next year uh, is a reasonable assumption. Uh, the reason why I'm just uh, raising that is to make sure from a, from colleagues to make sure we understand uh, if you have questions or comments or need to digest this further, um, you, you have the opportunity to do that and you'll have several weeks, if not a, a month or two to be able to do that. Um, let me turn to uh, some colleagues here. I believe um, Delegate Krim, I think I see your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I know that the state of Maryland has a CAV working group and has had that group for several years. I'm just wondering if there's been any interaction between uh, TPB and that working group. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, uh, I have to remember. So there, there's an MDOT level group and there's a uh, uh, SHA level group. And I've had the uh, the the, the uh, privilege of at least listening in on the MDOT group and uh, participating on the SHA group. And uh, I think that's been very fruitful. Um, uh, and there's uh, uh, a whole lot of uh, complexities in this issue. So uh, I think we, we talk about some of the same things. Um, there are, it's a different perspective from a, a long range planning agency versus a, 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 a transportation system operations agency, but we were definitely uh, uh, in communication. And this is Carl Lewis from, from MDOT. I would add the MDOT SAV sponsor SAV group has been around for nearly six years. It's chaired by um, MDOT MVA Administrator Chrissy Neiser and involves stakeholders, both public and private and governmental. Um, and anybody's welcome. Legislators also attend at times as, as well. So yes. they're working to make sure that we're dealing, everyone that needs to have input has input and um, we welcome any additional input. So um, the last time I was at one of their meetings, they were discussing a West Westminster pilot um, CAV project. Um, I don't know if you have any update on that. I don't have the details on that, but I do know they're looking at other corridors. Obviously that route one corridor um, between Baltimore and Washington has been one pilot corridor that we've been working on and we are looking for a second one to the West, correct? Thank you. I, I'll follow up with that for you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Um, let's see, Ms. Russell, I saw your hand up. If I may unmute. Um, so I'm not sure how to ask this question. Um, I know in, in developing the software and programming in CAVs that there have been there are lots of sort of morality choices um, or morality issues in terms of, you know, a Sophie's choice situation, if you will, where the vehicle has to choose, you know, one terrible outcome versus another terrible outcome. Um, is there anything in our policy statements here that would sort of address how we might want to make sure that is approached? Thank you for the question. I guess I would say um, we, we certainly did discuss that in some of the committees and uh, the principles number one and two are, are you know, phrased in the most encompassing way to try to address this, which is to say, ensure the safety of everyone on or near transportation facilities in all situations. That's number one. And of course, number two is equity as well. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess we could, uh, the, the, the challenge here is that you can get wordy pretty fast and, you know, we can have multi pages of this. So we're trying to to get the most impact out of the fewest words. So that's where it is. And certainly, you know, we, we've heard those, you know, those statements, but we, you know, that's the outcome we want. Ensure the safety of everyone. All right. Thank you, Ms. Russell. Uh, let's see, Mr. Wilhan, I think I see your hand up. 
Thank you. Um, first, uh, this is a uh, great work. I really appreciate the uh, presentation on these and, and your work in developing them. Uh, I wonder if the, one, well, the piece on transit might be made more explicit because I do think that there are um, uh, one of the concerns I think that we have is that is is just the that uh, that um, these uh, autonomous and connected uh, vehicles could um, could could take away uh, con um, from our, our transit system and um, and impact it negatively. I think. With the right policies, autonomous and connected vehicles could be could be used to enhance our our use of transit and by, for example, uh, focusing on last mile connections um, uh, and um, and also uh, making transit more accessible to people who are um, who who have disabilities who might not be otherwise uh, have easy access to transit. Um, so I wonder if that might be made more explicit. Uh, I also wonder. I also have a question, just generally about the um, about how this is going to be operationalized, and if you really thought through kind of how how we might be we in local jurisdictions might be able to translate these uh, principles uh, into actual policy that will um, that will actualize it. Thank you for the questions. Um, so for the uh, first question. Um, I did not, uh, for the sake of time, I did uh, not focus on what is principle number seven, which is about enhancing the provision of transit, including providing opportunities for microtransit access to the region's high capacity transit stations. So I think that gets at a little bit about not just you know, prioritizing transit, but enhancing transit. And along with number six, which is support the priority of transit on the region's roadways, that's where we are now. I certainly welcome the board's feedback on how that wording could be if there's there's something that should be added or or or, or changed that would be closer to the the way that you want to state this. That that is certainly open. Uh, as to your second question, um, I think uh, you know we do have the 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 last principle, which is that we want uh, you know uh, our staff and we we want to work together to try to keep up on the uh, the complexities and 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 the change that is in market forces and the development of technology, and that is certainly a challenge. Uh, so uh, perhaps there's more that could be said on how to operationalize these things. Uh, uh, they are the statements of the, of the desired outcomes and, and, and admittedly they are not about the strategies or tactics to get there. Okay, thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, and Mr. Meese, thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure again, this will come back up uh, in front of the TPB in the coming months. And so I know uh, there'll be more comments and questions uh, that we can have with Mr. Meese as well as follow up to this. So thank you. All right, let's turn to our last item on the agenda of Voices of the Region Focus Groups. This is our last informational item for the day. Sarah Bond from staff is going to review what we heard from residents of the region uh, in several focus groups that staff had conducted earlier this year on the topic of transportation equity, safety, and climate change. These focus groups were part of the current update to our long range transportation plan visualized 2045. So Sarah Bond, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon uh, to the board. Uh, thank you for having me. I, again, my name is Sarah Bond, transportation planner um, here at the TPB. And today I'm going to pr be providing a summary um, findings for our 2021 focus groups. These focus groups are part of a larger initiative that included a regional survey and QR po posters. So um, today I will be giving you some summary findings and key takeaways for um, this initiative. So the purpose of these focus groups, they were designed and implemented to understand the issues of transportation equity, safety and climate change through the perspectives of different population groups and how that relates to our TPB regional priorities. Uh, so we conducted 11 focus groups, all virtual on Zoom. Uh, these focus groups range from geographic location, income, age, race, and education. Uh, we decided in this case, we wanted to hear about, or we wanted to hear from members of underrepresented communities uh, to gather a diversity of perspectives and backgrounds. Um, therefore, it was important for us to form these uh, homogenous sessions to provide a safe space for participants to share freely about their perspectives. So uh, 11 focus groups, 17 hours of audio, 600 pages of transcripts, a lot of information. So in this presentation, our summary of funding aims to provide an overarching summary of what we heard, but we really hope that you 
read the report to get a much wider scope of the many topics that came up uh, during the focus group. So um, to get started on the next slide, I'm going to be reading a quote from Isabella in Owen, Maryland. Throughout this presentation, I will be reading uh, some of the direct quotes from participants, and I ask that you listen or read along if able to on the slides. Uh, there isn't enough time to unpack them or read all the quotes, but uh, we hope that this gives you some insight into what we gain from this research. So Isabella says, I think from a global perspective, I think we need to think in the big macro terms of moving people and goods from one place to another. But we also think about how we experience those things as people, whether we're young, whether we're older, whether we're physically able, whether we're physically challenged, and try to think a little bit beyond that immediate, this is faster, this is efficient, this is cheaper. Um, so we really wanted to start with this quote because we think it really speaks to why we decided to do these focus groups in the first place. Um, so now we're actually going to skip to slide seven um, and get into the summary of the findings. So um, first on the next slide with equity, we asked two questions about how participants feel about equity and their transportation experience and um, what they were consider for to tell transportation officials in order to ensure equity in the transportation system. Next slide. Um, so in this slide, there are some major themes and findings that were common amongst all focus groups. Again, it's hard to get into the meat of what all was mentioned, but this sort of speaks to um, some common threads that were found amongst all focus groups. So the findings include uh, transportation costs are burden. So on the topic of equity, almost every focus group mentioned affordability. So uh, the cost of riding the train was highlighted, the cost of riding the bus, uh, particularly amongst transit dependent participants. Uh, other concerns of affordability focused on the high cost of tolls and the cost of housing close to transit. Another theme, inadequate services for disadvantaged communities. So participants noted that transit services do not seem to be planned with the concerns of people with real economic needs in mind. Uh, for example, a transit dependent individual spoke about the infrequency of bus services, which is particularly problematic for service workers working night hours or those who don't work the traditional nine to five hours. Another theme, geographic geographic inequities and transportation options. So some participants spoke about um, the supply of transportation services in different parts of the region. So particularly for uh, our suburban participants, they spoke about the lack of transit services, uh, which make them more dependent and more likely to drive and use cars. And then uh, the next theme, feeling left out. So in various ways, participants talk about how they often felt like they were denied access to opportunities, um, and some said they even felt like second-class citizens when comparing the transportation options with advantage. Next slide. Um, so now I'm going to be reading a quote from Sharon in Washington, D.C. She says, someone offered me a job out in Rockville for home organization, which is what I do for a living. But she was offering 15 an hour, which is minimum wage here. But you add the costs to me of going out there and coming back, the times plus the weight. It's not worth what I'm going to spend on Metro. Next slide. So uh, with this report, we've uh, prepared some key takeaways that we believe transportation agencies can respond to concerns of equity, climate change, and safety. And so for equity, equity we believe expanding service windows or providing alternate types of services to accommodate late shift workers or again those that don't work the traditional nine to five hours uh, improving reliability frequency and service areas for buses and minimizing transportation costs to lower income individuals including tolls and transit costs especially for distance-based metro fares next slide so now on to safety uh, again we asked two questions dealing with safety we asked participants to describe what makes them feel safe uh, when using their preferred method of transportation and um, to describe their experience with safety and the transportation system. Next slide. Um, so again, some 
themes that came up across all focus groups for safety. Uh, participants say that ped bike infrastructure is missing. So in numerous sessions, uh, participants said that walking and biking often feel like life threatening activities. Uh, they noted the absence of sidewalks or crosswalks or bike lanes. Um, some participants even specifically call out call out protected bike lanes as a feature that makes them feel safe. Another theme uh, participants shared that they often have after hour fears. So um, concerns about safety are often focused on traveling in the evenings or at night. And so for those participants who work in service, the service industry, or again, don't work the traditional nine to five schedules, um, express fears about walking on dark, dark streets with fast moving cars or just fears about crime. And the next, uh, lastly, another major theme of driving many participants particularly for those from suburban locations spoke about feeling unsafe when they drive uh, particularly when encountering other aggressive drivers or when driving on poorly lit roads or driving congestion so on the next slide we have a quote from raul in alexandria virginia he says when i walk at night from work i'm concerned about not being seen by drivers walking in dark places not enough people around and having to deal with crime it's too much safety is not only being in the car and driving safe it's about housing infrastructure people you know also transportation the people only want to see one thing next slide so some key takeaways we believe that transportation agencies can respond to concerns of safety are by uh, recognizing that the details do matter so the places of transit stops and making sure that there's sufficient lighting around those stops and stations um, investing in transportation infrastructure that separates total uses that travel at different speeds such as protected bike lanes which many participants specifically call out and investing in infrastructure design policy and enforcement that limits aggressive behavior on roadways so, um, next slide. Moving on to our last final topic, topic climate change. We asked again two questions. We asked participants uh, to imagine if they had a magic wand without limits or boundaries to describe uh, transportation choices that would reduce their impact on climate change. Um, next slide. So, some key findings here uh, for climate change is that many participants talk about how environment friendly options are often not feasible. So many express an understanding that their individual travel choices have an impact on climate change and greenhouse gas emissions, but they also noted that these environmental, uh, these environment friendly options are often limited or not available. So some specifically note that, you know, they would like to live in a transit oriented community, uh, but such places are often not affordable. And another key theme here um, that from participants is that they said that climate change is not an immediate personal priority. So in many cases, participants were very blunt and honest about the fact that uh, climate change was simply not a priority for them because um, while the nature of this focus group in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, where there was a extreme global threat of public health. Um, so some feel that, you know, but there are bigger worries that are more present and that more current that we should focus on before we're able to tackle climate change. So in the next slide, uh, there's a quote that speaks to this from Cindy in Washington, D.C. Um, Cindy says, it's kind of like I look at it like if you're in an airplane, you can't help somebody else if you don't take the oxygen first. And so you need to be healthy in order to be able to work in the environment for positive results. Next slide. So some key takeaways that we believe uh, transportation agencies can respond to concerns of climate change by recognizing that the strategies and solutions to mitigate climate change are in competition with the immediate challenges of everyday lives. So the solutions must be realistic and they must be feasible in order to be implemented broadly. And the next to improve the supply of low carbon transportation options, including making transit more frequent, reliable and convenient, uh, making housing close to transit more affordable and expanding electric vehicle infrastructure and access to electric vehicles. So uh, next slide. Uh, for our final slide, I just want to share what's to come next. So I know this was a lot of information and there's really a lot more, um, but we as staff invite and encourage the members to review the report, uh, to read the quotes and narratives from the Voices of the Region and to 
um, there will also be a breakdown of each focus group uh, much more deeply. So uh, definitely encourage others to read the report. The findings, we're also working to be, integrate them throughout the Visualize 2045 plan update. And then currently working on Voices of the Region story map that will include uh, narratives and voices from all three public outreach initiatives. So uh, next slide, that completes my presentation. Uh, thank you, and I think there may be time for questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. We do have a couple of minutes for, uh, for any questions or comments. So let me turn and see if I have any colleagues. I'll just do it by jurisdiction again. Let me go to WMATA and any other agencies. And then let me turn to Maryland, and I see Ms. Kostick's hand up. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, really great information, and um, I've looked at it a little bit and looking forward to delving in a little deeper. Um, I really appreciate the emphasis on equity, and I think this will be really useful to us. Um, also, the looking at the climate change perspectives as well. Um, one of the things that seemed like a gap to me looking at this was um, input specifically from young people, teenagers, for example. It looked like we we started with um, age eighteen and older, um, and it didn't seem as well in, with regard to kind of the questions we asked. Um, for kind of demographic information from people that we collected information about whether they had children. And I just wanna make sure that we're getting really a broad um, set of feedback from young people and from families that are, um, you know, taking their kids to activities, to school, accessing childcare. I think it is a slightly different perspective than families that aren't and individuals that aren't. And so I'm wondering if there's anything that I missed on that um, and or if there's any way to add some of that um, before we finalize this. Um, yeah, I think that, thank you for your comments and your question. I think that uh, I agree with you that that definitely is a demographic that deserves um, special attention. And we specifically, just with the younger population, we know that that is a group of people that we often miss in public participation and getting comments. So we definitely uh, wanted to focus on getting those perspectives in the focus groups. I will say that um, there is a lot of perspectives and a lot of comments and narratives uh, from families or people talking about children and, or going to schools that kind of show up a lot within the report, um, but definitely not something that we specifically call out or focus on, um, but definitely shows up in the report and with our narratives and quotes that we specifically identify. And so I think um, if you, when you have time, or if you have time to uh, look at the report that you will see that that perspective comes up, but no, it's definitely not, well, it's not something that we intentionally call out, so. Thank Can you. I yeah, I, I did see some of the, the comments um, that did talk about taking their children um, to school and are worried, being worried that they would be late picking their children up, which was very, very helpful. Um, I would just ask if there's any way that we could do any additional outreach specifically to teens. I think that to me seems like one of the, the remaining gaps and then in the future, try to maybe add that question about um, having children as one of the demographic questions, since I think probably many of the participants do, but just to call that out and be able to, to disaggregate that I think would be useful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Virginia. Mr. Snyder. Sure. Thanks. Thanks much. I'll, I'll be very quick. Um, it's sometimes useful to validate what you think you already knew. So um, this is extremely useful and I'll be looking to see how we integrate this into our long range plan. The other thing that I think, even though the focus is on different groups, the reality is pretty much everybody wants the same thing. So I think that's kind of an interesting um, context about multimodal, reliable, safe uh, transportation systems. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. Um, and on that point, I'll certainly agree with you as well that, um, you know, seeing the, the early slides of fun where you're talking about, you know, it's not just affordability, but reliability, safety, all the other pieces that go into that, I think are pretty consistent with a lot of things we've been talking about. So it's really good to see that uh, reflected back. So. Uh, Ms. Bond, thank you so much for putting that information together. And again, we have the full, uh, you know, more in-depth information available for everybody. All right, well, I think that's going to take us right to time. Uh, so it's right at 2 o'clock. 
Um, when Pam opened the meeting, she said, we're going to finish on time and we did it. So thank you, Pam. Set the tone strong. I appreciate it. Uh, I want to remind everybody that our work, our work session is on December 13th um, from 3 to 4 p.m. So um, again, that's December 13th from 3 to 4 p.m. will be our work session. And then our regular board meeting, the last of 2021, is at noon on December 15th, 2021. Uh, so with that, Charles Hallett, anything else, I'm going to adjourn us. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. So I Mr. hear something. Chairman. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, this is Senator Dave Marsden, Virginia. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, very, just very quickly, uh, I apologize. I, I missed the roll call. I had uh, the system didn't recognize my email for a little while. But I was wondering if there would be any problem up for having the governor's transportation conference in Virginia in Arlington on December 1st, 2nd, 3rd. And on the 2nd, uh, we're, uh, up, we're having a joint transportation committee meeting in the House and Senate. One of our topics is driverless electric shared vehicles. And I was wondering if it might be possible, if it wouldn't create a problem, to use a couple of Mr. Mises' slides, uh, which would be a great way to conclude the presentation that I have in mind and wondering if that would be okay. I saw Conti nodding his head, so I think that means it's okay. But how about this, Conti and Senator Marsden? Can I let y'all connect uh, individually after this to see about those slides? Absolutely, we'll do. Happy to do okay. that, uh, Senator. Great. Yeah, please just give me a call. Yeah, we'll do, it. sir. Thanks. Thank you. All right, sounds great. All right, then on that note, I will adjourn today's meeting. So have a great uh, Thanksgiving holiday, everybody, and look forward to seeing you again soon.